listening to The Cooler Ring, a podcast made for manufacturing marketers. Here are Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Welcome to The Cooler Ring, a podcast for manufacturing marketers brought to you by Cooler Partners. My name is Jeff White and joining me today is Carmen Perry. Carmen, how are you doing, sir? I am happy to be here, Jeff, and you. I'm glad to be here as well. I'm looking forward yeah. to today's show. Agreed, agreed. I, um, I, you know, we've uh, we this isn't an episode that's all about sustainability or anything of that nature, but it does kind of knock on the door of that as a subject. And we've kind of danced around it in a num- number of areas, um, often uh, with respect to kind of the packaging category, etc. So it's kind of I'm, I'm excited for today's show because it's a kind of a different angle on that, a different uh, um, a perspective. Absolutely, and we and we've had a few guests on the show as well who have a a double life. You know, they might have come come to marketing within a manufacturer as an engineer or something like that, but they rarely combine those roles. <laughs> you know, after they find marketing. That's fair. There's not a lot of folks that have been on the show that kind of have a joint uh, kind of product innovation, product development and marketing uh, yeah. uh, uh, role. So that is, that is uh, true. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. So joining us today is Sylvain. <laughs> I'm going to have a hard time saying this. We, we talked about it before the show and our guest has a French name and I like speaking French when I have the opportunity, but uh, he felt that it was better to uh, perhaps Americanize it a little bit to make it easier to find on the internet. And I, I totally appreciate that. So joining us today is Sylvain Marcille, Marcille, <laughs> Marseille, how we would say it in uh, in French Canada. But uh, Sylvain is the uh, VP of Marketing and New Product Development at Pelton Shepherd. Welcome to the Cooler Ring. I apologize for butchering that three different ways. Absolutely. It's my great pleasure. Uh, and, and yeah, you can, I, I said to everybody, you can say my name the, the, the way you want. Uh, the easiest way is Solvay Marcille, but, but if you want to speak French, it will be Silva Marseille. And I'm, I'm very glad to, to be here with you guys. I'm super excited about the chance to, uh, to connect with uh, thought leaders on the mar- manufacturing, marketing and innovation. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have you on the show. Why don't you, um, in addition to um, uh, simply introducing your, you in two different languages, uh, we could probably uh, dive a little deeper into uh, in, into uh, your background, Sylvain, and uh, perhaps tell our listeners a bit more about you and the firm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, to introduce myself, I'm, I'm an engineer by education, but marketing strategist and product guy by trade. And um, uh, my current role is uh, Vice President of Marketing and New Product Development on Pelton Shepherd. Pelton Shepherd is um, a gel pack manufacturing company focused on uh, B2B. Uh, So we help companies uh, ship perishables and pharmaceutical uh, that require temperature control. And this is a company that was founded in 1950 by the grandfather of the current CEO, uh, Jack Shepherd. And uh, the, the, the COVID has been great to our business, if I can say, because a lot of people needed and wanted to have perishable ship home so they don't have to get out. Um, and so we had had a lot of growth over the, the, the past years. And, um, and, I, and I joined the team about a year and a half ago to, uh, to help with the marketing effort to continue to uh, fuel the growth uh, and also to help, uh, you know, the, the innovation part of the, of the business. It's a company that has been innovative. But because the growth was so fast, uh, you know, the team didn't have the time to work on your product as much as, as uh, the, the, the CEO wanted to. So that's, that's why I joined. Well, Sylvain, I don't know if, uh, if Pelton Shepherd's products get, uh, are part of what I'm about to mention or not. But if you ever find yourself here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, when you land in the airport, you'll find that there are a couple of businesses there that are dedicated to selling you lobster that you can take on the plane. And of course, it has to be uh, remain frozen. Uh, so uh, I have no idea, uh, but I think if it's if they aren't a customer, I, I think we can probably find an in for you there. Okay, all right, yeah, they they they, they could be. They, they probably are. You know, we 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 have a, a leading position in the in that market, and uh, you know, we, we're we're thankful to be uh, 
to serve the, the largest companies in, in the US. So I, I don't know about this particular aspect, but I know we can help. Let me put it this way. <laughs> well, look, uh, I do want to kind of um, dive into what you've been doing. Um, what I would characterize as kind of leaning into the, the, the notion of sustainable product development and what that means. And, and, and through the through the lens of a of a, a beta launch that you've recently done, but uh, uh, maybe before we we get there, we talk about sustainable gel packs and kind of what the work that you're doing there. I'd be curious to understand how you've synchronized that effort with customer demand or insight, because I think one of the challenges when it comes to sustainability uh, for for companies in your kind of space is they sometimes struggle with how much they ought to be out in front of the consumer or out in front of the market versus reacting to uh, demands for more ecologically friendly solutions. So um, I guess how did you synchronize, if you will, with the market? Uh, what was your customer discovery process? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Yeah, the, this is very interesting uh, because this touches an area which which is important to me is is to uh, the customer discovery aspect is to as an engineer, uh, you know, in my career, uh, I worked a lot of new product and and sometimes I was disappointed by the success of our product and and I just realized that we were not focusing enough on what was really mattering to the customers. You know, it's it's uh, you know when you're an engineer, you're like, oh, I have this new feature that I think is going to help, and it does, but everything equal. And that's the problem that you forget that this is just one part of what makes, you know, the value proposition for the customers. And if you don't pay attention, maybe this particular thing that you're trying to solve is not that important, actually. And so sustainability is one of them because our customers are businesses serving consumers. And obviously, consumers have a, have a you know, strong pool for sustainable solution. Uh, but, it's a, it, you know, we make product for for the businesses, not for the consumers. So we have to be careful. You know, it's a, as, as I always say, you know, the, the diaper is not a product for the, the, the baby. It's a product for the parent. You know, if you ask the baby what they want, they say nothing. Thank you very much. Uh, so that, and it's the same for us. We, we bring solution for businesses who serves co consumers. And so um, what I did when I started this, uh, this role uh, about a year ago is that I, um, I did a, as much as possible, uh, a, um, a customer survey where I would talk directly to the customers and paying attention to choose the, the right decision makers. Uh, you know, making sure that I talk to the people who are in charge of the, the, the business strategy overall and, uh, and be careful not to talk too much to the people who are in charge of the tactical aspect of purchasing, for example. Not that I don't want to talk to them. Of course, I want to talk to them. But it's more important for me that I understand the context of the business. And, and once I do that, uh, you know, of course, I ask about pain points. You know, what, what is the problem? How is your business changing? What kind of problem did that create for your business? What are you doing about it? That's very important to understand. What is the customer doing about this particular issue? For example, supply chain issues. Um, uh, and what are the pain points associated with that? So you go from the, you know, very general to the down to the, you know, nitty gritty. Um, and, and so throughout this process, you, you take a lot of notes about, you know, what is important and what they're saying are the pain points. And towards the end of the call, uh, I ask, OK, well, so you, I make sure that I got everything. You said this pain point, this pain point, this pain point, this pain point. Did I forget anything? Typically, no. Uh, and I said, OK, well, it, next year, let's, let's imagine that my budget is, you know, whatever, one million dollars for new product development. How should I spend this money? Should I split it? to fix all those, you know, evenly to, to, to solve all those problems? Or should I really align? And, and I, I, people say, I'm not sure. I say, well, let, let's look at it. Let, let me split it evenly. Is, does that sound right? Say, well, no, just put more money here and there and stuff like that. And at the end of this process, you have a ranked, you know, specification of the thing you should to work on. And, and the reason I'm telling all of that is because when you look at sustainability, people say, you want to say, well, what's happening in your, in your business? Well, wow, you know, we need sustainable solutions, sustainable solution. But when you ask them to rank it, you just realize that what really helps is reduce cost <laughs> and improve quality. You know what I mean? It, it, of course, it's great. Uh, sustainability is great, but it's not that important. It's important to do something about it, but it's not that important. 
Well, and you mentioned too how you know it's important for you to be aware that you're selling to other businesses, but you also have to be contextually aware that they're selling potentially to consumers or to other businesses that sell to consumers who may not be willing to increase the cost in order to have a more sustainable solution, even though we all agree it's better. And, and, and so that's the challenge is that you have to, um, if, if you're developing a sustainable solution, the end game is to make it as cost effective as possible to the point that there is no cost adder to the, to the, to the, to the business. Um, and so th there's two aspects is that you have as a, as an innovator, a product development guy. I have to to test new solution to see if I can change the the basis, right? And so, one of the product we released recently is Terra Ice, and and uh, the it's a product that we make to to understand how we can help the market with a very sustainable gel pack. Initially, it's meant to be a niche because we know that the cost and and the the usability of it is so different from the standard. That's going to be difficult, especially for the big guys to adopt it. But by identifying the people who are trying to create a very strong brand around sustainability and working with those and making sure we debug it in a way that is interesting to them, uh, we'll get there. You know, most innovation, they start and there's plenty of things wrong with it. You know, uh, and, and, and that's how you, you win is that you, you little by little, you improve it and then you are the perfect, you know, uh, product for the market and you know think of the tesla cars right they started you know it was it was supposed to be a niche uh, for an expensive car for you know certain people who were kind of like nerd about the technology um, and then little by little they get to the point that they're super cost effective and, and they are the most sold car in the you know in the u.s in the world uh, and so that's the approach with terrace we have something which is very special very designed to be completely unique in the market uh, because it's a, it's a gel pack which is uh, completely compostable. It uses a, a certified compostable film and a gel which is made from basically food uh, gelling agents. The reason we did that is because we wanted to make sure that downstream from the value chain, you have, you know, you have my customer, the, the, you know, the HelloFresh, the Blue Apron of the world, and then you have the consumer. And downstream from the consumer, you have the composting facilities who are the people who are going to say, I, you know, that's useful to me. I'm glad to see it in my, you know, I, I, I'm okay to receive this. Or they can just say, you know what, I, I don't understand this. I don't want it in my, in my stock. And then, and then once that started, it's very difficult to, because they're downstream the chain. It's not like you can communicate to there and say, hey, I fixed my product. You know, you can get it. No, they're, they're done. And that has happened in the past with uh, people who design compostable cutlery. And they made them look exactly like the plastic counterpart, which was a good idea from a standpoint of acceptance from the customer. Terrible idea from the composter standpoint because the composter starts seeing both arriving in their stock. And they're like, well, we can't tell who's compostable, who's not. So th that's it. We're not getting anything that is a white plastic cutlery anymore. So, uh, and, and so, you know, they, and it was really hard to come back from there because, you know, now there's this, this, uh, perception that anything that is pl white plastic looking will never go to the compost. So they had to, you know, do something different. So that's what I was thinking with these products is make sure we make it very different looking. The gel pack is very green. It's transparent. It looks like nothing else. It looks like the scrap bag that you use for your scraps if you're doing composting. And, um, and we make it extremely composter friendly uh, and also co consumer friendly. You know, one of the friction points we hear from, from um, consumers or, you know, being a consumer myself is that it's a little bit confusing what you have to do with those gel packs when you want to dispose them, which is most of the experience from the consumer, by the way. They don't need that. Mm. They just need to dispose of it. Um, and so some of them you have to cut open and empty in the sink. Some of them you have, you know, to separate the gel from, from the plastic so you can recycle, hopefully, the plastic. I designed the compostable gel pack that you just toss it in the compost bin and don't worry about it. Or actually toss it in garbage if you don't have a composting facility. It's actually better than the plastic equivalent. It will degrade much faster, I guarantee. Uh, but you ha don't worry about it. Just toss it. If it's not unfrozen, toss it. Don't worry about it. Just toss it in the compost bin and, and feel good about it. That's the idea. Um, so, sorry, there was a little bit of segue out, out of the topic, but hopefully that was relevant. I don't know. It's it's incredibly relevant. I'm I'm curious though because you you mentioned that um, you know sustainability is important, but a whole lot of other things are maybe more important to the business, um, cost, etc. But you've chosen to um, 
you know, focus a fair bit of product development effort here on a sustainable solution. In the course of that customer discovery, is it that you just really found that there were two different segments, if you will, like, and, and there was one segment that did have a very strong sustainability focus and was maybe even willing to pay more. Is that what kind of led you to kind yeah. of down this path? I'm trying to get a sense of what, to what extent are you leading the customer or are they leading you? Yeah, that's actually a really, yeah. Well, first the customer should always be leading you. <laughs> that's my rule. You know, you, you, you should, your action should be driven by what the customer needs. Okay. And, and that's something that, you know, got me excited when I interviewed for the first time was, was Pelton Shepard is that the CEO is laser focused on customer and customer service. Um, and, and so it, it should be the customer, uh, but it's a very good question, uh, Carmen. The, uh, the answer is it, it is a little bit of a segment. It's a little bit of a dynamic segment. It's more like new entrants into those markets have to create their brand. Okay. And so to create their brand, this is a very powerful tool because you have a gel pack that is very unique. It creates this unique experience for the customer and you do, it really shows that you're trying to do something very different from everybody. So that's the point. The tool that I created is a tool for my customer to have a better branding success. <laughs> that's for my customer. For my customer's customer, I create a very frictionless user experience. And for my customer, customer's customer, to a certain extent, the composter, I create uh, a safe product to get into. You know what I mean? But the, f the person I serve the first is my customer. And so those are the customers who are getting into the market. They have to build a strong brand. At that point, it's more important than anything else because they have to be known into the marketplace. But, you know, this segment is dynamic. And I can tell you a story. I was working with this, you know, uh, you know innovator in the field of meal kits. And we were working together on this compostable gel pack. But of course, it took time, right, before I, I got it right. I mean, and after about a year, I got it right. But by that time, that customer who was new to the market, who was trying to build his brand, had shifted to, you know, our brand is strong enough. Now we need to shift on our operations. And you know what? Operations means cost, which means it's not as important as anymore. So, you know what I mean? That's what is interesting. It's, it's not that it's a segment. Mm. It's mm. more a stage of maturity in the company. So, yes, it's a segment, but it's a dynamic segment, if you will. I mean, in some ways, you might listen to what you just said and say it's a bit of a recipe that you're you're going to be dealing with a, maybe the up and comers or the challenger brands in this kind of model. But you know, there has to be some leaders in the category that want to also lead in sustainability. I got an example. Pat Patagonia is a very leading brand when it comes to sustainability, but they're not small by any stretch. Yeah, so that that's a very good point, and that's something which is which has been a big learning on my career, is that um, of course the big guys they want to be innovative and, and they they often are to a certain extent, but when you start with something innovative that you are still building up, okay, we're still trying to identify how to do it right. And by the way, you know you always start with something which is not usable, expensive, and stuff like that, and over time makes it you know makes it work, makes it cost effective and 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 reliable and things like that. So the big guys who have you know, a large supply chain, uh, at, you know, of course they want to innovate, but one of the things which is most important to them on an everyday basis is their operations, their quality and their cost. So it, even though they tell you, hey, we want to be innovative and stuff like that, you need to understand they are a big machinery and they have cost and quality is, is, is the most important. And by the way, it's interesting, you know, we talk about that because I spend more and more effort and cost in improving cost and quality than working on this compostable gel pack, just to let you know. <laughs> because if for my market, this is actually way more important, right? But I do want to be the first one, at least our CEO is, is, is supportive to the idea of, we want to be innovative, we want to see how can we do better. And that involves trying stuff, which is not perfect at the first time, you know, and, and, and that is trying to do something very special so eventually you can prove it over time and you can be, have a leading position in this new creation of this new segment. Um, so the, that's really interesting texture, uh, too, around this, uh, you know, the big guys, they may have a, they may have a genuine interest in innovation. It, it's not even necessarily that it's lip service or that they don't want, but it's just the beast that they need to feed is quite a bit different. Their expectations are different, and their appetite for experimentation as a result of that is quite a bit different. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, that, and, that, and that's yeah, that, and you know that's a lesson that I've learned because I was part of those innovation team in large companies, 
So I, I, I very much saw the, the two sides of that. And, and I was also part of a startup, uh, you know, before this role, I was part of the startup. And I'm also an advisor to startups in the Bay Area. And, and that's one of the things that I tell them. I say, you know, they say, oh, we're talking to this very large account and stuff like that. And I say, well, be careful. You should absolutely do those large accounts. You should absolutely know what they, but understand that the people you talk to typically are, they're disconnected from making a business on an everyday basis because most of those people are not, don't have time to look in innovation. They want something that solves their problem right now, not something that could be useful in two years when it's debugged. <laughs> so, so you know, you have to be careful when you talk to those people. Don't get excited that you have a big name. I mean, it's nice to show to your investors, but actually your investors should know better. You know, your investor should be like, okay, show me people who are buying this and it saved their lives on an everyday basis. That's what I want to see. I, I was on the investor side of, of, of the, the large company. And that, that when I saw this innovators and they say, oh, we have kind of this thing. I say, well, great. Well, who are you selling to right now? Who are, who is, can I call and go say, hey, for my business right now, this saves my life. And that's the only solution that I have. So I deviated a little bit, but that's the same principle that, you know, Work with the innovators, the one that will debug your product with you. Uh, those are the most important people. So you can get traction, put in the field, understand what's... Because you don't know what you don't know until it's in the hands of the customer, right? There's maybe a completely a, a big problem that you had with the product that you didn't know or the other way around. There may be a usage of your product that you didn't know. Uh, think of Viagra and Coca-Cola, right? We started with completely different stuff. And then they put them in the hands of customers and they're like, well, what do you know? Well, Coca-Cola, of course. Um, Has and, anybody tried tried combining them? I wonder. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Is a, that like Mentos and Diet Coke? A very different thing. <laughs> I I do think uh, so. Man, it's it's interesting because you know this idea of working with early adopters and kind of getting their feedback and going through that. But you're also incorporating some other, you know, elements of design thinking into your process that are you know, as much about building a brand that is built through quality products and, and innovation that people start to associate with that brand. You know, I'm thinking about your, your choice of color for the product and kind of, you know, putting those things together in order to make it obvious that this is not the same as a plastic gel pack, Absolutely. for example. So no. how do you, how do you kind of, are you coming to the market with that idea or is that an example of, of feedback you might have received from, say, the compost processors down the line or, or how, how are you finding that out or thinking about it? I'm glad you asked, Jeff, because that is, uh, that is purposeful and it is also based from the feedback is that the best way, in my opinion, you can create a brand is when it's linked to your actions, right? I mean, you, you, you can... You can yell I'm the best or, you know, you can yell I'm sustainable enough that people really believe it. Or you can be sustainable and just show a few times people that you are. And that will, that's to me is a much stronger message. And so my branding strategy is always you start by, by acting and, you know, acting with a brand, if you will, and making sure you're consistent in acting the brand. For example, you know, at, at Pelton Shepherd, we, our brand is about trust. You know, people say you guys have the best service. You know, the, because, you know, when you buy gel packs, not the therapeutic gel pack that you buy one or two in your life, when people come to us, they are buying a supply chain. I like to say gel packs is a service uh, because that's what it is. You know, we, we, they come to us and they, be, they buy a partner, they buy a supply chain that we're going to work for weeks and they're going to get like pallets of pallets of gel packs every week. And what matters the most is not only the product, of course, the product is good, uh, the quality, the price, everything is good. But what matters is that my business is changing all the time, especially when it belongs to consumer products in the, in the end. And so how fast can you react to the fact that my organization is growing so fast that I have no idea what I'm doing and I have all those changes in my, you know, you know I, I don't have forecasts that you can trust because, because my customers don't, you know, change their mind all the time. And, and the temperature outside is changing all the time, which means, you know, maybe I need two gel packs in my box today, but maybe tomorrow I need three. Uh, and so we are very active and that's, that's why also you have to be close to operations a, a little bit, you know, because this is, you, this is what the brand is. I can yell to everybody and say, we are very reliable, but if we're not ourselves reliable, uh, w w that's, that's not worth spending all this money, you know, and pretending what to do, what you're not, you know, to be what you're not. So, uh, th that's why the, um, so to come back to to your comment about the gel pack, uh, 
creating the brand is ha it has to be purposeful based on what the customer wants. And so the customer wanted something that is they can confuse it with a traditional gel pack, right? It, it, it's it's a little bit obvious. Uh, it's part of the user experience is that they know, they see this gel pack and say, oh, I remember, it's the green gel pack. The green gel pack goes to the compost bin. No doubt. You know, there is like, I, and, and so that's why also I trademarked the green gel pack. I trademarked the, the green gel pack. Um, and so that's why I designed it this way. I'm like, it, it is part of the experience. So the green color, the fact that it looks like a scrap bag, is part of the branding and the experience. You know, I'm, I'm delivering... Uh, what what the brand that I want to create, because the brand I will create is what I deliver. Well, I think this is um, I think this is some great advice that marketers who aren't in product development can still leverage, um, mm -hmm. and they uh, should greatly. Yeah, 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 they yeah should. this notion of of thinking down the value chain and 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 not just uh, you know in some ways like this is a almost looking for where down the value chain. Could could this get? Could we face a roadblock? This isn't even really about. I mean, yes, it is about making composters' lives easier, but in some ways, it's mostly about making sure they don't say no. They don't say <laughs> like just start diverting it and and ignore the the, the core product benefit because obviously the upstream impact of that would be massive. And I think that's something like. There's an awful lot of marketers that are, are, are working in spaces that new products are being developed and launched. And maybe those product dev teams haven't thought that far down the line, but the marketers can. Yeah, and, and, and you know, the, the product people the product people nowadays, especially when you're working with something that's going to touch the customer, which means it's going to have to have a sustainable, you know, framework around it. You have to think about that. And, you know, I want to... You know, I, I want to speak about something about sustainability in, in packaging. That's that's something which is important, and it's just going to be for manufacturing people is go, is going to be huge over the next years. Is the, the LCA, the life cycle analysis? Um, you know, it, there is what the consumer wants, and there is what the data is telling you you should do, and they are often not the same. I'm going to say something which is very controversial, but controversial. But if you look at greenhouse gas emission, um, you know. My traditional gel pack may be actually better than my super compostable gel pack, because right now those supply chain are new. You know, making a, a, a compostable film requires more energy and more greenhouse gas typically. Uh, also, because typically for the same performance, you have to have something which is a little thicker, which means you're adding weight to your product, which means you're adding, you know, transport, you know, uh, uh, cost and 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 gas to your to your product. And so, for example, you know, there's this study which shows that, you know, using plastic bags is maybe better than using uh, paper bags for groceries. Uh, because, because when you look at the LCA, you, you just realize you're spending all that energy, you know, making it work with, with paper bags. So, and I'm not saying we should not use paper bag. On the contrary, I say we should use paper bag. So eventually those supply chains are so efficient that they're just as good as the plastics. But they're not there yet. Right, because it's new. Because it's the, those supply chain have not had the the luxury of fifty years of of improvement that the plastic industry has. You know what I mean? It's it's not a black and white answer. It's it's more like, okay, from, from which standpoint are you trying to look at, and what are you trying to do? If you're trying to satisfy your your customer, and the customer is the consumer, give them what they want. Don't argue with them <laughs> until they're LCA experts. Just give them what they want. So they want paper paper bags. You give them paper bag. I mean, as a business, you have to. At the same time, if you want to, if you want to make the right decision for your future, don't spit on the plastic. Plastic has its space, you know. Plastic it should be there, should be part of the future, but in an intelligent manner. You know, are, are you trying to avoid a situation where there's no oil in the earth and everybody's starting to kill each other? It's probably a good idea to start, you know, reducing your dependency on the fossil fuel. You know, so I think that effort is good, right? Um, and, and so there is that that argument too. Uh, your uh, your commentary on the LCA is an interesting one because it um, uh, I I I agree with what you're saying. The notion of, if that's what consumers want, if they want the pa the paper bag, they give them the paper bag. Because trying to com make them LCA experts is a losing uh, proposition. And you're 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 spot on, which is the challenge that somebody who let's say a flexible packaging manufacturer who only makes plastic bags, uh, you know, they may be looking at it saying, 
you know, they, they, they're going out and making paper isn't an option. So if they giving the customer what they want means that they're no longer a customer. Um, and often people propose these kind of LCA arguments as a way of, of having that conversation and trying to convince the consumer to bring them around to your way of thinking. And man, that is hard. Yeah, that is hard. And, and, and you know, some customers are very sophisticated. Uh, you know, Amazon, you know, when, when, when they talk to us, they say, okay, can you show me the LCA data of your product? That's the first thing that they ask, you know, they're like, okay, because they are very sophisticated. They, they have the means and, and at the scale of Amazon, can you imagine when they make a decision on their packaging and they shift to it, it has a huge impact on the earth. I mean, they, they, they are, you know, one of the most, the may probably the biggest packaging consumer, in, you know, on earth. So, um, you know, that, that makes a difference. So those, those are very sophisticated. And, and so people are trying to build a brand and they want to use, for example, uh, mycelium based, um, you know, you know, packaging, you know, to replace EPS, to replace post driving. Um, I think it's fantastic. I think don't look at the greenhouse gas, emission of of you know the mycelium because you you'll, you'll shoot yourself in the face it, it, it's it's heavier it uses way more energy but it's it's still the right thing to do in my mind you know what i mean it's still the right thing to do because of course right now it's heavy and it's complicated but by the time it has the scale of plastic and eps it'll be just as good and maybe better i think, I think that's a really clever uh, positioning and, and kind of argument here that frankly i haven't heard a lot of uh, i heard people trying to make uh, excuses but you're actually, I, I like your approach. Like, no, 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 we don't need to make excuses. It's, it's, it, it is higher greenhouse gases now, but, that, but now is not what the problem we're solving for. We're solving for three years from now, five years from now. That's a really great, and uh, uh, Sylvain, I'm, I'm going to say as we kind of wrap up the show, I think uh, just to come back to your commentary with respect to branding, I, I, I feel that was in, incredible advice. Uh, do and then tell, don't yell. <laughs> if I had to summarize what you were saying. Yeah, actually, that's really good. I'll, I'll kife that if you don't mind. <laughs> no, well, it was yours. I'm just, <laughs> I'm, just, uh, I'm just copywriting a bit on the fly here. But look, honestly, I thought it was just um, uh, really, really solid advice. And I think for anybody, particularly waving a sustainability flag, it's something they maybe got to take to heart. Because um, you can uh, get a lot further with that do and then tell uh, approach for sure. Uh, so, Van, thank you so much for sharing your, your expertise with, with our audience today. It's, it's been great to have you on the show. Well, thank you so much, guys. I'm, I'm, uh, it, well, first, it was a pleasure. And, uh, and, and I'm so excited that there's a podcast like yours who talks about our everyday problem, uh, you know, as marketers. Uh, I think it's fantastic. And, and by the way, as a marketer, I think that uh, influencer marketing has, is much more important nowadays than, you know. Uh, I mean, I still have people who send me email marketing, and I'm, I feel sorry for them. <laughs> no, I, 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 that's mean. I shouldn't say that. I mean, there is a place for email marketing, but I think this is a, a medium that that is just going away, like just like paper, you know. Uh, and, and and I think that what you guys do is is much more value added than anything else. We appreciate that. Well, look, it's, uh, I appreciate that, and uh, it's uh, again, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Let's uh, look forward to uh, reconnecting in a couple of years, and we can see if email marketing is dead at that point. That'll be the subject of our next. <laughs> I, I certainly hope It'll so. be coming back to flames. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Sylvan. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Cooler Ring with Carmen Perry and Jeff White. Don't miss a single manufacturing marketing insight. Subscribe now at coolapartners.com slash the cooler ring. That's K-U-L-A partners.com slash the cooler ring.